Uh, Paul, go ahead. I'll keep, I'll keep trying to find it, but you can talk about it. Okay. Uh, so tomorrow uh, from 9 to uh, noon, uh, at the Salvation Army office just down the street from our Cornerstone meeting place, uh, we have the opportunity for four or five Rotarians to join in the food distribution, um, uh, which was uh, paid for uh, from funds from the uh, Rotary Club of Fresno Foundation. Um, and we awarded them uh, $5,000. And uh, the distribution is tomorrow. And we asked uh, to participate in that so we could see how our, our uh, funds are being used. And uh, they have agreed. So. Um, we only have uh, one other volunteer so far, um, besides myself, so we have room for about three more. And uh, if you're interested, just go ahead and call my cell phone um, after the meeting. That's 559-284-6050, or uh, shoot me an email and I'll get back to you. Great, thank you, Paul. I was having uh, difficulties trying to share it, but uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, thank you for that. Um, and uh, like you said, get a hold of him. That is tomorrow. So we want to make sure that uh, for those of you who like to take advantage of a great time to do that. And with that, um, I had mentioned, I believe two weeks ago when we first got back together, I wanted you guys to all get to know your board members a little bit better. And uh, very fortunate with us today. Um, we have Zarok Tarosian, who is going to uh, be our guest of the day and handsome young man here. Uh, give me one. Oops. Handsome young man there with the, he's the community and government relations manager for Kaiser Permanente. Uh, Sorok, are you on? I know you're on. I saw you here a little bit ago. You're not on my side screen here, but I got your uh, PowerPoint pictures on here. I am, Ryan. I'm not with you. I'm at home. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. But uh, uh, Sorok, uh, let's talk a little bit about, first and foremost, let's talk about your position with Kaiser. It's, uh, you've been there for a number of years now. And what exactly do you do? I've been with Kaiser since 2000, and I am the Community and Government Relations Manager. I have a dual role. I work with elected officials at the federal, state, and local level. My job is to create relationships with them because um, healthcare is a highly complex and regulated industry, so a lot of laws are being enacted uh, that impact healthcare and our organization, so my job is to inform and educate elected officials whenever there is legislation that could be uh, good or bad for um, our organization and our members. And prior to that, I was with the Workforce Investment Board for seven years um, right after college. Now, besides the Community and Government Relations Manager, you also have another title, and that's a coach. Uh, maybe we can, uh, oh, give me one. There we go. So uh, maybe explain this a little bit. Uh, it looks like you're a, 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 a huge fan of soccer. A friend of mine called me about 18 years ago and said, hey, you want to come and help coach? So I said, okay, I'll check it out. So that was 18 years ago. I, I coach for a club um, called California Odyssey. It's a competitive travel program that you get to play throughout the state. And um, I've been coaching with them all this time. I know it's crazy, but um, over those years, I have had the opportunity to travel all over the state um, and coach young student athletes, teach them and mentor them in the game of soccer. Last July, about a year ago, right this time, um, my team went to nationals um, and uh, we lost in the semifinal. Uh, which was a you know incredible experience. So, no, that's great. Yeah, no, and, it's crazy. And obviously, you uh, you have a couple of kids there. Uh, uh, no, I have uh, three. <laughs> yeah, three of them, absolutely. Uh, but I family. forgot to say earlier that I've been a Rotarian since 1996. Wow. Um, I first joined the Rotary Club of Clovis, and. Um, I was a member there for a long time, but Fridays was difficult for me to attend. So I moved to, to our club, I'm not sure when. This is my, my family in the pictures. One of them is my, on the left, is uh, far left at least, is uh, my son's senior day. Um, he played for Clovis North, he plays club soccer, and he will be playing hopefully uh, in college 
providing, you know, they get to play, um, you know, maybe in the spring. And yeah. Right, this is graduation. I don't know if you can uh, see. It. Yep, so I have, I have um, you know, I have two boys and um, a daughter in between. So. And you got to do some, uh, got to do some touring. I assume that's not this year, though. No. <laughs> No, that was uh, two years ago. We traveled to uh, Italy, France, and Greece. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sharing no, thank that. You. Thank uh, you. Clovis has lost his our game. We appreciate. We love everything you've done for our club, and uh, look forward to you uh, serving on the board there. We're going to have a introduction to all of our board members over the course of the next three months. I just want every all of our Rotarians to get to know them better. So uh, uh, you'll see some pictures and some fun stories along the way. So thank you, Sarah. And with that, I'm going to move on. We have another guest today, and that is uh, our, our Zoom bomb of the day. And I know he's on here. Just got to find him somewhere. But uh, Mr. Rich Rodriguez, KMPH26, is uh, dropped in to say hi today. And I think you're here somewhere, right, Rich? Oh, oh, we got to get, let me get you uh, unmuted here. Oh, let's, we can see you talking. I'm just, uh, can't, I'm trying to get you unmuted here. Uh, you should have gotten asked to unmute there, Rich. I unmute. There we go. There you can go. You yep. We got you. Ah, the magic. <laughs> All right, Ryan. Hey, thanks for letting me uh, do the quick Zoom bomb. Hello, Rotarians. Uh, gee, I'm from the, in the bowels of uh, Fox 26. They've got me in the sales department. I'm one of those guys who refuses to work at home. Most of our reporters are working at home. Our anchors, uh, they still come in. We come in on Sundays, but I got to tell you, when it comes to technology, I am not good at this. And my <laughs> son, uh, he's 20 years old and is very adept at this stuff. And he goes, dad, you're not working from home. I'm not going to be the resident troubleshooter every time something goes wrong. <laughs> I got it. It took me five minutes to figure out, and I couldn't hear you, so I put my little ears in. Uh, just to tell you that, uh, you know, here at Fox 26, since COVID-19 started, everything's changed. We do interviews, uh, a lot of them I'm sure you've seen uh, by FaceTime, by Messenger, uh, by Skype. Uh, you know, it's just different. Uh, we're keeping our social distance. We are going back on stories, but if you've ever seen that microphone, there's a poll now on the microphone. You know, we, we, we really got to be careful in this. And uh, I'm 65 years old, so I've said when it comes to some kind of protest, some kind of march, I'm not participating because I'm just too damn old to get that close and, and, and taking a chance. Ratings have never been better at 10. Uh, you know, we've always been number one, but now it's just kind of like grown even more. People want to know about COVID-19. They never tire of it. They want to see the numbers every day. And, you know, for us, sometimes it's just really depressing, but uh, people want to know what's going on. I've been doing this. This is, uh, I celebrated my 44th anniversary in broadcasting yesterday. And I'm, really? I'm getting older, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not ready to retire. My wife's a teacher, so uh, she's got to... Uh, Oh, two, two and a half years to go. So I'll probably go out the same time she goes out. And I will say my son is a junior at Fresno State, wants to follow in daddy's footsteps. No, that's all I got to report to them. And no, Ryan, it was great to have I, you on I, TV last night. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say I was on your channel last night. Um, and, and, and a little bit of a personal note here. I mean, I can I think I can unbiasedly say this. Um, uh, Rich was absolutely my grandparents' favorite uh, person to watch here locally. Uh, Rich, it had to be on your first couple of years in the Valley here. You, you met my grandpa. Oh, they held my hand. They taught me a lot about, <laughs> about uh, farm reporting. I started at KMJ Radio back in 77. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, the lobs were the greatest. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I'm, uh, I'm the third generation to work with Rich. I'm not trying to age you there or date you, but uh, I am the third generation that's uh, had the pleasure of working with him. Uh, Rich, uh, for those of you who don't know, besides his on our TV personality, for several years he hosted um, an ag show on the radio on Saturday morning. So I got to see Rich about once a quarter uh, talking all things ag. And so uh, he really, truly has uh, uh, been just an incredible legend here on the local scene and appreciate all he does over at KMPH there. So 
Rich, thank you so thank much you, for joining us today. Uh, as always, love to see you and uh, oh, uh, glad you're taking care. It sounds like it's been a pretty crazy four months for you all, but I uh, appreciate that you've uh, been able to stay safe through all this while still bringing us the news every night. So, Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Rich. And with that, um, I wanted to just, uh, we have a ton of guests today. Uh, don't have time to introduce all of them there. I think we'll probably put them in the notes at some point there, but I wanted to uh, point out a couple of special ones for us. Uh, with us today, because of our uh, guest that we're gonna, our, our guest speaker that we're gonna hear from just in a second here, um, I wanted to make sure that we uh, uh, brought on, I, I actually asked in, uh, uh, for Frank Gonzalez, the Sanger mayor to join us today. So I think Frank's on here. So Frank, if you're out there, welcome. I got Joe Del Bosque, who is uh, really known as the social media farmer out there who does an incredible job helping tell Ag story. I got him on here. Um, I got uh, obviously our friends uh, over uh, Fresno State there. We got Jim Boren. Uh, we have columnist Armin Bacon. Armin, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, Rob Soroyan, the president of the uh, Valley Children's Hospital Foundation. I know he's supposed to be on here. Uh, I've got several other ag folks on here. Appreciate all you joining us today to hear this uh, great presentation. And with that, I want to jump over to our guest speaker for today. We're very fortunate with us today because of um, trying to make the best out of the situation we're currently in. Um, this is an incredible opportunity to bring in folks from outside the area, folks that normally just wouldn't be able to travel here to speak to our Rotary Club. So it gives us an opportunity to zoom them in and be able to hear from them firsthand. And today is um, very proud to say that we were able to make this connection work. He has actually spoken to this Rotary Club once before. Um, we were talking on Saturday and he said it was several years ago when his, uh, I believe his daughter was still very young, but uh, they made the trek up to Fresno and were able to join the Fresno Rotary at that time. So this is his second guest appearance. But with us today, we have Mr. Ruben Navaretti, who is a columnist. Uh, he is the most widely read Latino columnist in the country and the 16th most popular columnist in America, according to Media Matters. He is a nationally syndicated columnist with the Washington Post Writers Group, whose twice a week column appears in nearly 150 newspapers. He's a contributor to USA Today and FoxNews.com and a columnist for the Daily Beast. Uh, he is uh, on television. He has appeared on dozens of shows and on radio. He's on dozens of local and national shows, including uh, National Public Radio. He has hosted radio shows in Phoenix, Dallas, San Diego, Fresno, and Los Angeles. And he's contributed to the Wall Street Journal, the Denver Post, the Chicago Tribune, Texas Monthly, on and on and on. He's a graduate of Harvard College and the John F. Kennedy School of Government. He's the author of A Darker Shade of Crimson, The Odyssey of a Harvard Chicano. Um, he's also a contributor to Chicken Soup for the Writer's Soul and Chicken Soup for the Latino Soul. He lives in San Diego with his wife and three children. Ruben, thank you so much for joining the Rotary Club of Fresno today. Brian, so good to be with you. Thank you for having me. This is a strange blend for me of the strange and the familiar. I have spoken to this group before. It was about uh, 12 or 13 years ago when my 15-year-old daughter uh, and I got on a train in Oceanside near San Diego where I live, uh, near Carlsbad where I live, and we went up to Fresno. I took her with me. Uh, she introduced me to the group that day. It was somewhere, I think, in the Fulton Mall. It was a huge audience, and uh, this is my second time, but the technology is new. Uh, I've never spoken to the downtown Rotary Club via Zoom before, uh, and that'll be talking to Ryan uh, this, this weekend. We were going to talk for 15, 20 minutes. We got talking about fatherhood and schools and back to school and farming. I think we were on for an hour and a half. So it was great to, uh, to have that conversation with him, learn more about the group. Uh, it's always great to be home, even if it is only virtually today. And um, uh, also, Ryan should let you know, if there's any problem with the sound, let me know. Uh, if you can hear me clearly, let me know, because if not, we'll, we'll go to the, the court if need be. It's actually, it's, uh, fairly, I wanna, clear, Ruben. it's fairly Okay, clear. great, thanks. It's the convenience of using an earbud, but sometimes the audience, the audio is better with a cord. I want to thank uh, some of my friends who've joined me and look out and see some familiar faces. Armin, thank you for being here. Jim Boren, who I've known a million years, uh, give, give Jim away there. Uh, Rob Soroy and Joe Del Bosque, give Frank and Vallis, who I've known even longer because Frankie and I went to uh, high school together at Sanger High School. It's great to see everybody. Um, we have about 15, 20 minutes together, and then I'm going to get into the best part of this, which is I shut up and I listen to all of you, and I get to take some questions and, and hopefully get some answers. Um, you, a lot of you know a lot about me just from reading me over the years. I've written 3,000 columns, over 3 million printed words in 30 years. It all started, simply enough, uh, with an op-ed in Fresno B. In April of 1989, the uh, editorial page editor at that time was Tom Kerwin. This goes back a long time. 
I wrote pieces when Jim Bourne was the editorial page editor. Uh, and then I went on to write for three different newspapers and get syndicated from the Washington Post. And that's kind of how it all started. Um, but it's been that long. Some of you know me, you MJ as a host and a guest on Ray Appleton's show and the like. But let me give you three pieces of my, my biography you may not know. Three things I'm sort of going through right now uh, in this uh, year of the plague, in this year of the virus, in these last five months that we've all gone through that have been like no other, that we've never experienced and, and God willing, we'll never experience again. So the first thing is uh, I started off in 1989, over 30 years ago, in Fresno as a writer. And then I became a freelance journalist, an author, a reporter, a Metro columnist, an editorial board member, syndicated columnist, and now landed here. I'm a communicator and I, I'm actually a communication specialist. I work with people helping them tell their stories and create their own media. And uh, this is something Brian and I spoke about before. Uh, there are institutions out there, be it farming, police, uh, the medical field, the university fields, children's hospital, they do not do a good job of telling their own story. Uh, they're much too humble for their own good. They don't talk about the things they do right. And in turn, uh, the other folks, the opposition defines them. The one group of people out there that never tires of talking about themselves are politicians. Politicians are exceptionally good at telling their own story. They tell us way too much about their lives, and we know too much. Uh, but that kind of ability to tell your story is really critical to, get, to getting people's attention at a time when, like all of you, and thanks to these devices that we carry around in our hands, we're standing in front of fire hydrants that are spitting out news and information. And we need ways of sorting through it. We need context. We need a way of understanding the world. And I joked with Ryan, it's something like I could watch, um, you know, CNN and Fox for a half hour or an hour talking about, let's say, violence and policing. And after the hour, I understand the issue less than I did at the beginning of the hour because of the spin, because of the misinformation, because of con contrasting agendas at work. Uh, and there's so many people out there when I speak around the country, they just want straight news. You know, just somebody just create a television network. It's just called News TV or Truth TV that just gives me, you know, tell me the who, what, where, why, and without the spin. And so in the absence of that, it is challenging to provide that kind of context. So people are in need of creating their own media. It's created an opportunity. And I uh, work with clients, all of whom are the heads of nonprofits, to help them tell their story and create their own media by way of books, podcasts, speeches, and the like. The second thing that's kind of interesting is, you know how they've said during the pandemic to reach out and call friends and check on them. So I've done Zoom calls and I've been sort of roped into Zoom calls with uh, two or three groups of people and started off with my high school classmates at Sanger High School. I went to Sanger High School. I graduated in 1985. And so I get uh, sort of a virtual reunion going where people would come together and we have, we're all over the country and we come together on a Zoom call. And that was nice. And then I uh, started doing that with uh, Harvard friends. I was roped into that as well, and some Harvard friends, uh, and I would get together and talk. And I realized that there was one component missing. So I had made it my mission to do something, I think, interesting, seek out people who I went to elementary school with. So going now all the way back to Madison Elementary in Sanger, uh, those people that I know on Facebook and elsewhere, I've set up calls with them. I've spoken to at least five or six of them already. And we catch up on everything. How are you doing? How's your health? How's your family? Uh, and some of these people I haven't spoken to in 20 or 30 years. But we've always sort of known each other and been on the outskirts of each other's lives. Here's the interesting takeaway for me. As I think about each of these calls with my elementary school friends, my high school friends, and my college friends, it's almost like they're talking about three different Rubens. These are three different people that they all know. The Reuben that they knew in elementary school is not the same one they knew in high school, not the same one they knew in college. And as I sort of moved along, you know, evolved for better or for worse, made mistakes along the way, uh, it's interesting. And I think that's true in all of our cases. If you think back to your upbringing and you connected with your high school students, your high school classmates, your college classmates, your professional uh, colleagues, they'd all sort of know a different version of you. So that's been interesting uh, for me. Uh, it's also led to a great deal of introspection, my third and final point is that one thing that has kept me sane, borderline sane at least, I have teenagers, one preteen and two teenagers. Uh, my wife and I are all working under one roof, right? Trying to take the pandemic seriously and stay indoors as much as we can over the month. And one thing that's gotten me through is a lot of introspection, a lot of introspection. 
And um, as you think about yourself and as you think about what makes you tick and where your values are and what you value now versus what you value 25 years ago, it's been an interesting set of revelations for me. And uh, I wrote a column where there's a line in a Bruce Springsteen song, um, sad man, my friend who's living in his own skin and can't stand the company. This idea that uh, we've all experienced this. I've had friends tell me, hey, I've been in my house for five months. I'm sick of my house. I used to love my house, but now I'm just sick of the four walls. I've memorized every inch of my house. Some people say I'm sick of my own cooking. You know, I've done so much home cooking. I just want to go outside to a restaurant for a chance. And for me, uh, I've also heard friends say that they're sick of their own company. And I think I, I qualify for that. You know, I, I'm an introvert, and I thought I was an introvert, at least. And I, it turns out I need people more than I thought. I didn't realize that until so all my lunches, my breakfast meetings, my dinner meetings were all taken away from me. And now all of a sudden, uh, it's just me on Zoom calls and phone calls, and I'm talking to friends I went to kindergarten with. And uh, it's just me. And the more I get to know myself, the more I become uncomfortable with that. And uh, I write about that and I've expressed that. And here's the takeaway. It has produced in the last five months some really great columns, some very difficult columns. I, as I said, I've been doing this for 3,000 columns, and some of them stick if you read the stuff I've written the last five months, it really does stick out. Uh, my Father's Day column, my Fourth of July column, you know, what, is it, what does it mean to love America as I love America at a moment like this? When America is bleeding, America is hurting, America needs us more than ever. And so I wrote about that. And uh, I wrote about Donald Trump's speech at Mount Rushmore and the fact that I'm a never Trumper, I don't support the president, I haven't voted for the president, I don't plan to vote for the president. However, having said that, I thought he gave one hell of a speech in Mount Rushmore. And I, I didn't like or appreciate the attempts by the liberal media, the anti-Trump media, to tell me otherwise, to say that somehow that was a divisive speech. Uh, to me, that was a speech about loving the country and that's not a divisive concept. And if the left thinks it is, the left's gonna lose another election. So I wrote that, got a ton, a ton of angry mail, a ton of angry mail from the left. You know, a lot of angry liberals out there. Uh, usually I'm, I'm bombarded by angry conservatives. This was a little bit different for me. And then at last, I wrote a piece about the opinion page editor at the, uh, the New York Times who resigned and what's going on in my beloved profession of journalism. You know, because I, I love newspapers. I have loved newspapers since I was in high school. And I was in high school, I was reading the Fresno Bee, and I was reading the op-ed page, and it was full of syndicated columnists, Russell Baker, Tom Wicker, Anthony Lewis, Ellen Goodman, Bill Raspberry. And I was, I was a kid. I was, I was 15, 16, 17 years old, and I, I just loved what I was reading, and I loved the paper for presenting those kinds of, of opinions to me, a kid in Sanger. And it pains me to see what's happened to my beloved institution, and that's op-ed pages, where op-ed pages have been a place where curiosity goes to die, different opinions go to die, it's become a place of indoctrination, and if you are just a little bit conservative, a little bit middle of the, middle of the road, you're not going to have a home at some of the major papers at the New York Times or the Washington Post on their opinion page. So I wrote about that as well. So those are the three takeaways lately. For those of you who, who maybe thought you knew me a little bit, that's some of what I've been going through for the last five months or so. Let me um, wrap up as I go to, to, to end this and then talk, talk to you about your questions and answering questions you have. Let me um, focus on one simple concept and that's the lessons that I hope we'll all draw from 2020. And I touched on this a little bit with my Father's Day column, but this was, that was more about my lessons to my kids. You know, I, I'll tell you where that started. I was watching the riots and the protests after the George Floyd um, killing. And I was, my kids were watching it as well. I wanted my kids to understand that if you want a new iPhone, you know, you should do what we used to have to do in Sanger when you want something. You have to go out there and work for it. You have to go out there because your father and mother are going to give you a chore list and you're gonna go out to the neighbors and start a business or something. Um, I wanted them to understand you have to work for things, that you don't just pick up a rock, throw it through a window and take the eyes off. And I was very concerned that among all that looting and everything that we were watching, that my kids were gonna get the wrong message. So I wrote a column about the right message. But now if we broaden it out beyond our kids to ourselves, to all of us, here's some of what I hope we're gonna learn from these last five months. And maybe the, the next few months, which who knows what they'll hold, right? Uh, I hope we learn humility. I hope that the one thing the coronavirus should be teaching us is that we're not that smart. We're not smarter than the virus. The virus is many times smarter than us. Um, we don't understand the virus nearly as much as we think. 
You can do a Google search and see all the things that we thought were true before that no longer true that used to be true. It's all over the map. It's very confusing. So I hope we learn humility. I hope we learn community. And we learn that we really do have to worry about uh, our neighbors and how their health uh, is faring. And I hope uh, we understand that uh, when people go through injustice, it impacts all of us. And we don't just get to go home and close the garage door and close out the world. I hope you learn empathy. And we understand that for folks who struggle and have pre-existing conditions, or the elderly, or people who have a different level of vulnerability, that we learn some sort of empathy there. I hope you learn accountability. I just wrote a column on the cancel culture. I decided I love the cancel culture, okay? If you tune into Fox News or even KMJ and you're told every day that cancel culture is a bad thing, that's wrong, okay? They don't understand the cancel culture. Cancel culture is great because cancel culture is about accountability. It says that if you're Nick Cannon, a TV host and musician, and you go on a podcast and you make anti-Semitic remarks, you are gonna lose your job in the morning. And I'm good with that. 100%. And if you're Colin Kaepernick and you take a knee or you wear socks on television that show cops as pigs, as a son of a cop, my dad was on the job for 37 years, I'm okay with that. The real poison in America is not that they're tearing down statues, the right is doing, the left is doing, the Trump, the anti Trump, no. The threat to America is a lack of accountability. Okay? We screwed up the one job we had, and that was to be good parents. It's not enough that we don't give our parents chores or we don't give our kids chores to do and we've made them lazy and entitled so they don't want to do work and immigrants come in and have to do these jobs that our kids won't do anymore. It's worse than that. Now, when our kids go out at night and they break a window or they riot or they do something egg a house or whatever they do, the parents just sort of shrug it off. Oh, kids are going to be kids. What are you going to do? You know, what are you going to do? And there is a huge difference from the way these kids are being raised today my kids' peer group, and the way I was raised in Sanger by my old man and, and by, as he was raised by his old man. And that's a real shame. And I think we make excuses for our kids. We go easy on our kids. And we have taught them that accountability doesn't matter. So I love the cancel culture because, you know, take it from me, I've been fired eight times. Eight times I've been fired in 30 years, okay? People say, oh, you were a journalist. You got fired from a journalist job. What were you doing? you got fired. And I said, journalism? Yeah, I was caught practicing journalism and I got fired for it. That's kind of how my business works. Uh, if you write about the wrong people or, or tick off the wrong people. I hope another lesson we learn from is learn about in this time is parenthood. I hope that because we had to live with our kids and we're right up with our kids and we're under the same roof with our kids, I hope that we learn about how important it is to take parenthood seriously and not let the schools or anybody else raise our kids for us. I hope we got a lesson on equality. Racial equality in particular, it turns out African Americans were not making it up. It turns out with George Floyd's killing, they were not making it up. They were not exaggerating. They have been saying for years that they're the victims of unequal treatment at the hands of police, mostly white police officers. And they were right. It's true, it's happening. And it has been happening for a long time. And we have video evidence of it. And I hope we also learn to appreciate our teachers in this day and age. And we learn to appreciate our cops, good teachers and good cops. Uh, we ought to do more to keep at arm's distance bad teachers and bad cops who make everybody else's job more difficult, but good, and good cops, uh, we need to respect them. And lastly, we need to learn more critical thinking, something I has kept me afloat in these many years of writing. Just when you think you understand something, go back in, tear it apart, and think through it again. You know, I'm not right of center, I'm not left of center, I'm not a conservative, I'm not a liberal. I, don't, I can't tell the difference between the two political parties. Uh, they both kick me off. I think uh, Joe Biden. Biden is a terrible choice for the Democrats. I think that uh, Donald Trump is a terrible choice for the Republicans. Here I am. Anyway, thank you so much for having me. I look forward to taking some questions from you. Always great to be home, even if it is only virtually. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Ruben. Um, uh, for, those, for those folks out there, you can either put a uh, question in the chat feature here, or uh, please just unmute yourself and ask your question. I know there's got to be a ton of them here for those of you who read Ruben, I'm sure, whether it's what he spoke about or uh, past columns there, I think it would be a pertinent, he would be happy to answer them for you. 
And, and maybe Ruben, I'll, I'll talk about that. I mean, let, let's, let's dig a little bit deeper. You and I talked about the political parties the other day. Um, I had sent you, I think two years ago, you wrote a column about essentially the GOP being eliminated and they really have no relevancy here in uh, California anymore. I mean, what is the future yeah. of California politics in your opinion? I mean, because uh, I think all of us would probably agree that no matter what the party is, a one party system doesn't work very well. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we're in bad shape in California. You know that already. Uh, farmers have it particularly bad in California because they're a red industry in the middle of a blue state, a deep blue state. The worst thing about our California politics is that the Democrats don't just have a majority in Sacramento, they have a super majority, which means they don't need a single Republican vote to pass anything. And I lived in 1997 to 1999 in Arizona, where I was told immediately when I showed up to cover politics there that there were no Democrats in Arizona to speak of. Every single office holder was a Republican. Our two senators were John McCain and John Kyle. And you had all the variation you wanted in the Republican party. You had moderate Republicans and conservative Republicans, but all Republicans. No Democrat was getting elected anywhere. And the end result was what happened, I would argue, in 2010, when Arizona passed the immigration law in Arizona. Eventually, a lot of it ended up being struck down. It caused a lot of grief because there was no checks and balances. For me, some of the most exciting states in the country are the purple states that are up for grabs on election night. Michigan, very blue and red, you know. Colorado, Florida, um, I would also add Ohio typically kind of tends to be on that bubble. And those are the, are the really interesting states because you need to have checks and balances. If you have a dark blue state, you're going to have problems. If you have a dark red state, you're going to have problems. And if you see the stuff that comes out of Sacramento, stuff it's just crazy. It had gone, it had gone off the deep. But I've seen this movie from the other direction. I assure you, anybody out there who thinks we'd have a better state in California if it was all deep red, uh-uh, no. The only way you get a good set of government going is to have a purple state that's equally split. Great, thanks, Ruben. Uh, other questions? Uh, Question, uh, Ruben, has social media been a positive or negative for American discourse? Uh, I'm going to say yes, right? Uh, I'm going to say yes, that's been a, a positive and a negative. It's been a positive because of the, it's like adding jet fuel to the idea of social relationships. Before this stuff came along, yes or no, you never had a way of keeping track of the people you grew up with. You know, you'd have to call them and find out how your kid's doing. Now, thanks to Facebook, you can keep track of and just eavesdrop on all of these lives of people that you know. And that we've come to take that for granted. It's a great gift. It's, an, it's a great thing to be able to see these people I cared about in high school and still do, and to see how their kids are doing. Oh, and their, their daughter just graduated from college. That's great. So that's a gift, and that's important. Um, Twitter has also, and Facebook, have become a great way to disseminate information. I don't mean something, an ad somebody puts up that's of dubious quality. I mean that if a friend tacks something up and says, hey, Ruben, I saw this story you might be interested in. And I've multiplied all the eyes that are out there working for me, right? So everything that I catch versus everything that my friends catch, uh, I think that's great. It's also a great sounding board to be able to put ideas out there to see if somebody is going to, how it's going to play, is it something that people care about? Maybe I'll make a good column. Those are the positives, but the, the negatives are the degree of anonymity has been hurtful because people are able to say things in a mean and personal way without what I, that word I used earlier, accountability, without accountability. And so uh, it's become a sewer in that regard. Twitter in particular, the, the trolling that goes on, people are attacked uh, for just having a different point of view. Twitter and Facebook and social media is not a place where you go to expose yourself to different points of view. It's where you go to have your view enforced. And nobody gets smart that way. Nobody gets, uh, nobody gets, it's not a good way to, to communicate. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, got a question here from Lori, uh, Lori Rubin. You talk about what is happening in journalism and the partisanship of it. How do we get back to true journalism where we just get the news and uh, form our own opinions? A lot of that has to do with people like my friend Jim Boren who are educating the next generation of journalists. What we have to tell the next generation of journalists is first and foremost, you don't have to freak out your parents when you go home and say you want to be a reporter, you know, or have a, a career as a journalist. You can, in fact, make a living at this. Uh, 
we need good journalism now more than ever. There is an opportunity for that. There's a rule book I think they have to follow. Uh, you have to be adaptable. You have to be multimedia. Uh, it's not enough to be fluent just in one kind of media anymore. You have to be fluent in all things. Different ways you can adjust and make yourself much more marketable and survive the, the crush uh, that comes uh, ever so often with newspapers and television and radio. But it's a very viable profession. So I think that, that people like Jim play a really important role there. Jim and I were both privy to something. I'm sure he remembers this, but we were uh, at Columbia. And one of the great privileges of my life has been I've been able to judge the Pulitzer Prizes four times. And um, twice on a pod judging all the editorial pages and twice on opinion columns. Each time I've judged, I've taken myself out of the running. I didn't apply those years. Uh, but I've really enjoyed it. And, and Jim and I will sometimes go to these things together where we're both out there. There's 70 journalists and we break up in a pod. You get to see everybody you know. And at night, you actually have an opportunity to speak on one night to graduate students at Columbia. Now, this is the creme de la creme best journalism school in the country. And when we talk to these students, there's no doubt that they're smart and they're very tech literate and they have bright futures. The troubling part, at least for me, is that they don't play the game by our old set of rules. They would look at people like me like a dinosaur because I grew up thinking and being taught that reporters are supposed to be objective. Reporters are not supposed to have opinions. Reporters are supposed to keep them, their opinions to themselves. When you become like Navarrete and you become an opinion columnist, then you get to have all the opinions you want. But when you're a reporter, you have to play it straight. And what we sometimes encounter is for young people, they don't believe that anymore. Because when you give everybody a blog, a website, a page on Facebook, everybody's got a podium, right? So everybody's got an opinion. It's very difficult to teach this young generation to hold their tongue and keep their opinions to themselves. And they're challenging the very nature of journalism and saying, oh, no, no, that stuff's old. I don't believe that. My professor talks about that stuff, but I reject that. I think it's perfectly fine to be a kind of activist journalist. So it's a very, very dangerous trend. And if you want to fix journalism, you have to take it there. Uh, Ruben, I think you didn't leave any, uh, uh, anything to the imagination when you talked about the presidential candidates. Uh, but there's a question about who do you like for the Democrat VP? Democrat VP? I yeah. was asked, uh, one of the things I do, one of the things I do is I'm on the board of contributors for USA Today. They asked us all to come up with the answer to that question. And my answer and to write 150 words about it. It's online now, you can find it. It's also on my Facebook page on Twitter. And I chose Elizabeth Warren. My, uh, my ultimate choice was Elizabeth Warren. I thought she has the most she can bring to the equation. I think that, George, that um, I think that, that Joe Biden is a complete hot mess when it comes to race. I think he's a disaster when it comes to race. I think he's a disaster when it comes to the African-American community. He has so many skeletons in his closet regarding his relationship to race, you'd have to come up with another closet. And he's been bullied into this idea that he needs to pick an African-American woman. But who are we kidding? That's not going to fix the Joe Biden problem because he's still at the top of the ticket. So I think you should push that aside. And I think you should focus on the best person. And one of the best things you can say about Elizabeth Warren is he has a demonstration ability to get under Donald Trump's skin. She's the only one, not, not anybody else who's being considered, who has their own nickname. And when, when Donald Trump calls her Pocahontas, she drives him crazy. And if you're a Democrat, you want Warren on the ticket because he will be completely distracted. He'll be fighting with her and she'll be fighting with him. And I think it'd be a great ticket for them. Well, great, Ruben. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, our time is uh, coming to an end here, but uh, thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, appreciate it. As you mentioned, uh, native of Sanger, uh, happy to have you, uh, quote unquote, back home. Uh, and you mentioned about, uh, in fact, I, I, I was, Ruben sent me several columns to read over the weekend. Uh, really enjoyed your one talking about the football team from a couple of years ago. I did read that one. Uh, yeah. As, uh, most of the local community knows, uh, Sanger went on to, uh, uh, I think, uh, they lost the uh, won the valley championship correct they won the valley championship that year uh but it was a, a great run and uh, uh ruben just talked about with fondness i mean i think as all of us get older you talk more about fondness about your hometown roots and everything else but for you have not to have lost that connection and to keep that connection with your elementary and high school friends is something special there it's my first blessing it's been my important blessing in life i want to say that i was i hit the lottery when i was i got the parents i did i have great parents it made all the difference, but the, the second that a stroke of luck for me 
with being born at Fresno Community Hospital, being raised in Sanger. I can't think of to a better place to have grown up. Uh, and it really helped shape who I am. And it gave me those strong roots and foundations and values that have guided me ever since. Well, great. Well, appreciate it, Ruben. Thank you so much. We'll give you a virtual uh, hand here for uh, joining us today. Right. Thank, Thank you, you so much and uh, appreciate you joining us. And with that said, I got a couple of uh, small items of business to wrap up for today. We got two birthday boys on the uh, current line here or the current Zoom call. Uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, Terry Stone and James Bushman. I know I see James. I think Terry's on here somewhere too, but uh, James, uh, happy birthday uh, and uh, really appreciate all you've done for Rotary. And uh, uh, are you officially retired? Are you officially done yet or very close to it at this point? I'm officially 60 today, and I'm so looking forward to those senior discounts that all my elders have been having. So, yes, I work till the end of the week, but today is the real day. It's discount time. <laughs> That's awesome. And, uh, Terry, I know you're on the line, too. Uh, happy birthday. You got any special plans for today? Oh, I don't think he's muted. Oh, well. Uh, with that said, happy birthday to you too. Appreciate that. And in regards to uh, our next week's meeting, we have the council president for the city of Fresno, uh, Mr. Miguel Arias, who is going to be here to talk about, uh, essentially give us an update on what's going on at the city uh, government level, um, obviously focusing on COVID and what's uh, what the, what they're trying to do to combat it at the uh, city government level there. So hope you can join us same time, some same place. It's going to be on Zoom next Monday at 1215. If you're a guest, you're welcome to join us again. We'd love to have you. Um, and with that, uh, our meeting for today is adjourned. You're welcome to stick around and talk for some longer. Uh, but for those of you who need to get on with your day, thank you for joining us.